Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the read and write pipelines in Web3 storage. Um, Web3 storage is uh, soon the platform that NFT storage kind of rests on top of. Um, and we, you know, I think we built NFT storage in a couple weeks. Uh, so it was not built on like, you know, the, the most sustainable architecture. And as we've continued to scale, we've found that, you know, we can't really buy the scale that we wanted, so we had to go and build it. And now Web3 storage is really set up to be not just, you know, the provider for NFT storage, but for many NFT storage size customers. So I'm here to talk a lot about what we've had to do um, at scale. So a little bit about DAG House. We're a nucleating entity inside of Protocol Labs. That means we're in Protocol Labs and we're kind of like on the rails to become an independent entity. Um, and this is like a little bit weird to talk about in an audience full of protocol experts, but in the, in the broader ecosystem of service providers, it's pretty rare to have this much protocol expertise inside of one team kind of building. Um, so that's really sort of shaped what we've been able to do um, as a team and, and soon as an independent company. Um, we also have like a lot of real live users, um, a lot of whom just learned how to program in a boot camp. Uh, and they, they will tell you when things break, and they will tell you when things are too slow. Um, and so that's kept us really honest and really focused on user needs as well. So the, the way that we tend to look at things is what is the user need that we can kind of uniquely solve as a service provider with protocol expertise. Um, and man, it is awesome to build distributed cloud systems when your users hand you decentralized protocols. Um, nothing is in the way of you scaling that out and building it properly. Um, you know, we've had a lot of iterations now in cloud systems, and there's a lot of amazing cloud infrastructure that you can kind of pull off the shelf, but you're often limited by what your users want to do requiring some level of centralization, right? Like, no, no number of features in Dynamo will help you if what your users want to do is a SQL query. You are now going to be scaling a Postgres like, for the rest of your time. Um, and we don't have that problem, so this really should allow us to build like some best-in-class distributed systems on cloud architecture. Um, so talk first about the right pipeline. Uh, when we're looking at writes, we need to think about the writes being in three states. The first is at rest, so on a user's device. The second is we have the data. We've taken it into our system in some way and ingested it from the user. And the third is that that data is actually available in the IPFS network. Um, and that can be a little kind of tricky to talk about and guarantee, but I'll get into that. Um, so data at rest. For the most part, our user data is not already in a BitSwap node. It's not in an IPFS node, so we can't really take it over the pinning protocol. Um, the whole reason that they want to give us the data is to make it available in IPFS, so they don't already have it in IPFS to give it to us. Um, that said, it's also not already in a car file, but we would very much love it to be in a car file. Um, if it is already in a car file and broken into a DAG, then we don't have to do that work in our back end. But even more importantly, the cryptographic guarantees that they want to to do the next part of their workflow in the user's application is already available to them before we've made the data available. Like what we're looking at when we take in IPFS data is usually we're part of some other user's transaction, right? Like they're putting data into our system so they can get a CID so they can put it into a blockchain transaction or some other system. And giving them that early means that they can start to put that all together concurrent to us taking in the data, which really helps them out and, and provides like a much better user story where they get immediate feedback. Um, but some of the disadvantages here is that there's just not a Unix FS encoder for every language and every system. Like if you're on Python right now, like you kind of can't. Um, so for this, we've been building sort of two-stage infrastructure and looking at two-stage infrastructure where we, we take data in various formats and then turn it into a car file and then the car file becomes what we take in. And even our new pinning API that's getting built out is just taking pin requests, turning them into a car file and writing them into the system. And we'll take that for regular user data and we won't even take like tarballs for you know, directory structures and stuff like that. Um, this is, uh, it, it, we're currently in like uh, testing internally right now for this, um, so this isn't available to users yet, but this is a, a peek at like our new data received pipeline. Um, I, I, I'd hoped that a few people would talk a little bit more about UCANs so that I didn't have to <laughs> get into UCANs up here, um, but UCANs are, are an amazing protocol that you should really look at for delegating permissions to do certain operations. Um, and what's amazing about this delegation structure is that any DID can get permissions, receive permissions, and then delegate it to as many people as they want. And what we found very quickly is that 
our customers have customers. Like, it's not that you know, our user is going to give us the data necessarily, like their user is going to give them the data. And if they have to proxy it through their system in order to not leak a bearer token, like that really sucks for them. Uh, so we really wanted to build a system in which like, users could delegate that to other users and to devices down a chain. And so UCANs really gave us that. So the new system takes this UCAN request and it says, hey, I want to upload this car CID. A car CID is a, is a CID that's the hash of the entire car file that's coming in. It's not the, the root node in the car file. That, that's nothing. Don't worry about that. Um, it's the hash of the entire car file. And we actually enforce uh, SHA-2256 for this, for a reason that I'll get into in a minute. Um, then what we return to the user is actually assigned URL to S3. So this allows like the our customer's 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 device to directly upload into S3 without any proxying layer in between. And then we receive that into our system, and we can do stuff with it. We key that, uh, this is brilliant, we, we key that with the CID slash CID.car because the way that S3 implementations work is that, because um, now every cloud provider has an S3 implementation because uh, it's so popular, um, but the way that they work is that they have various like uh, load balancing algorithms and scaling algorithms, but they, they tend to find that by a prefix you need some data locality. So if you look on AWS's uh, documentation, for instance, and like what is the read and write throughput uh, limits in S3, they won't tell you that there's any limit on a bucket. The limit is always per prefix. So if you prefix by something that's a hash, you, like, you, you've now like, distributed all of the names across the entire set evenly, so all of their scaling algorithms are going to work like, kind of perfectly, and you hit like no limitation. right? Um, the other amazing thing is that in these signed uh, S3 URLs, you can tell it to validate the, SHA, the checksum of the actual input data. So we only give you URLs that will that, will, that S3 will validate with that SHA-256 hash. So, we, so if 1,000 users try to upload the same thing at the same time, we can give them all assigned URLs into the same bucket, and none of them can overwrite each other. So we basically have a lock-free upload infrastructure into S3, into our distributed system. I, I don't know of a fatter pipe of like, data coming in for IPFS data than that. It's, it's pretty brilliant. Um, so yeah, we're incredibly excited about this, and this is really set up for us to not just support like NFT storage, but to support thousands of customers the size of NFT storage. Um, once we have the data, we need to make it available. Um, and this is why we build Elastic IPFS. So the way that Elastic IPFS works is that you give it a URL to a car file as input. You don't like sort of write data into the system. Our original design actually was to write it into a bucket and get the bucket notification. And then we realized like this is so much nicer if you just decouple those things. Because now if it's just a URL, you can put data in different buckets for whatever reason that you want. Um, you can take data from remote systems and other customers that already put them up in, in like HTTP URLs. Um, doesn't really matter to us. And uh, this also allowed us to onboard a lot of data that we already had before we had the, the piece that I just showed you ready yet. So we actually have this running in production now. It's the main storage provider for NFT storage and Web3 storage. Um, and we were able to onboard like our entire backup bucket of car file data um, and then basically use the bucket that we were sending backups into as our like main storage infrastructure now without swapping out any infrastructure. And that was all able to come up in parallel to the existing system. Um, we then, so once we have a URL to a car file, that car file gets indexed by um, Lambda. And so every block uh, in that, we'll, we'll, get the, we'll pull the multi-hash out. The multi-hash will get written into these, um, uh, into Dynamo. Um, and we've just sort of uh, revved the Dynamo schema there. So that's, that works a lot faster now, too. Um, and then once, that, uh, once those records are in Dynamo, now there's actually a pool of Node.js processes managed by Kubernetes. So depending on the amount of load in the system, it'll spin up more or less down. And those are actually handling the bit swap requests that all come in over WebSockets. And then as far as like how we distribute and manage the WebSocket connections, we're just leveraging the regular AWS WebSocket um, infrastructure there. Like they do all of that load balancing for us. And in fact, we now get to operate as one peer ID for the entire system. Um, and we can even run in multiple regions and have that also managed by AWS and that connection. So this is really nice actually, because when you're a really large provider, you want to get added to every gateway's peer list so that you're just really fast without having to do DHT lookups. And if you're constantly adding new nodes into your cluster, you have to constantly be messaging to all of those providers like, hey, add these new peer IDs. So having one peer ID has been really phenomenal here. Um, all right, let's look at reads. Uh, so most reads come from HTTP gateways. Um, that's just kind of the reality right now. So uh, let's look at how we handle uh, some of that. 
we're, we're kind of in love with Cloudflare uh, for our read architecture and for really a lot of our HTTP architecture. Um, they have mostly free egress, which is really, really nice. Um, especially like being a multi-tenant um, IPFS provider is a little bit difficult in that you don't know which customer to charge for read throughput. Uh, because multiple customers can upload the same data and you're just getting the content addresses. So it becomes very, very difficult to actually charge for read bandwidth. So it's nice to have some revenue alignment here on like what we're being charged for and what we can actually charge our users for. Um, we built a gateway CDN, um, so it's not, I think that it may have been messaged as this a few times, but it's not technically an IPFS gateway, even though it has the whole IPFS gateway API there. It's really like a CDN in front of gateways. Um, and so what that, how that operates is there's the regular HTTP cache in Cloudflare, which is there for anything you do, including workers. And about 40% about of our requests just hit that regular HTTP cache and they're fine. Um, and obviously, like IPFS data is immutable, so all of those cache headers are, you know, never take this out of cache if you don't need to. Um, then there's a secondary cache that we have in Worker KB. Um, and we also have a product called Superhot where you can take any gateway URL and we'll just like take that gateway URL and cache it in Cloudflare forever, the whole rendered state. Um, so we can make that super fast as well. And those caches are actually above 60% of the 60% that come through the other cache. Um, so these rates are great. Um, and if it's not in one of these caches, uh, then we race a bunch of gateways. So who's the fastest? Um, Cloudflare was, was kind enough to actually uh, run a Cloudflare gateway in our zone, private just to us for this infrastructure. So we hit that one, we hit IPFS IO, um, and we hit Pinata, like all in parallel. Um, yep. So that's great. Uh, we're really happy with that, with the performance of our gateway right now. Our customers are really happy. Um, and having immutable data is amazing here because even the views on the immutable data are cacheable forever, right? So we have, a, you know, that e-tag is never going to change. You can return it with cache headers that say never let this fall out of cache. You're, you're very safe. Um, and now we're sort of starting to look at like what would a bit swap CDN look like uh, because we're very happy about all of this and we're really kind of unhappy with AWS's bandwidth charges. Uh, so we're, we're looking at uh, Cloudflare workers um, and Alan and Vasco actually got BitSwap running in a Cloudflare worker um, just like between the last time that I did this talk and now. Um, they're, they're amazing. Um, and we were running the math on this and it's actually cheaper for us to copy the data out of S3 into R2 and then serve it once than it would have been to serve it twice from AWS. So it's even having two copies of the data in two systems is like not really a problem for us. And we have a lot of processing workloads that we actually have to run in AWS because Cloudflare has like 2% of the features of AWS. Um, so yeah, we're looking into this right now and I, I think that we're probably gonna end up going that way. And uh, that's my talk, thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I should say, uh, there's a bunch of follow-up talks about Elastic IPFS and a few different tracks, uh, including the connecting IPFS track that I'll be running tomorrow. <laughs>